Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this live Q&A with entertainment critic Richard Roper of The Sun-Times. My name is Brian Ernst, and I'm now going to hand it over to Richard. How are you, sir? Brian, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. I wish we could get to all of them. There were literally dozens of them. And I want to thank everybody who's tuning in right now for this special live chat. And Brian is a, kind of our, our wizard behind the curtain, guys. He's going to uh, ask some of the questions that, that you guys uh, submitted and just uh, provide technical support and also emotional support, which we all need uh, in, in this time and age. Uh, before we get to the questions, I just want to talk. We're literally like three days away from the Academy Awards right now. So I just want to talk about some of the run-up to the Oscars, guys. You can get all my predictions at suntimes.com and all 23 categories there's still time to fill out your ballot for the beat the critic event but i want to, i just want to talk about some of the other things that have been happening uh i'm sure almost everybody who's tuned in right now is aware of or has watched the chris rock live netflix special which aired a few days ago I, i'm not going to get into a whole critique of of chris rock's uh, finally really answering uh to uh, will and jada pinkett smith uh he said what he said. It was his choice. I, you know, we could we could go on forever. I, I will say this, just in terms of how it relates to this Sunday's ceremony. I, I will tell you this, guys. I think the one person who was really, really happy to see Chris Rock address the elephant in the room in, in, in about a 10-minute bit is Jimmy Kimmel. Our friend Jimmy Kimmel, who's going to host the Academy Awards on Sunday, uh, because that took a lot of pressure off of Jimmy. He's going to have to mention the slap, at least in a joke or two, in his opening monologue. But now it feels like I think we all, you know, we feel like okay, it was a, it was a terrible, unfortunate incident. There's been a lot of fallout in almost every direction imaginable. Chris Rock has now given his response. So I think Jimmy can kind of he know he's very good. Jimmy Kimmel, one thing he's really good at doing, one of the many things he's really good at doing, is reading the room, and not just the physical room uh, at the Dolby Theater where the uh, Academy Awards will be held, but the worldwide audience who kind of I think at this point have a little bit of slap fatigue, if you will, and now he doesn't have to do a big deal about it because it's we kind of feel like. Chris Rock gave us the closure in one way or another on that. So uh, what I do expect to see at the Academy Awards this year is pretty much the standard ceremony you get every year, guys. It'll be about three and a half hours. That t running time is kind of baked into the cake because they're back to announcing all 23 categories uh, during the telecast. You know, for a couple of years, they're like some of the, I don't want to say lesser, but technical categories were not televised live. They would mention them during commercial breaks. It just offended a lot of people. And if you're going to have 23 uh, announcements of nominees and 23 winners going up to the stage and 23 speeches, that's almost going to be two and a half hours. And then you add Jimmy Kimmel monologue. You're going to get musical performances and commercial breaks. So if you've got an over-under, like some Oscar pools have, like go like three hours and 35 minutes. It's not going to be three hours long. Uh, as far as the major categories, and again, you can get all my predictions uh, at suntimes.com, and you can still fill out your ballot. But I just want to update things, and I'm not going to change my ballot because I feel like once you've cast your ballot, even in Chicago, you can't cast your ballot twice, despite uh, all the popular folklore on that. Uh, so I want to go through them really quickly just for those of you who haven't filled out your ballots or maybe you've got a pool with your family, your friends. Uh, we'll start off with Best Picture. And I do think everything, everywhere, all at once is going to win Best Picture. There's some momentum still for All Quiet on the Western Front or the Banshees of Inish Sharon. But uh, everything, everywhere, all at once has all the momentum. It is a blazingly original piece of work. Uh, it's kind of a cool success story because it wasn't made for a lot of money. It had it had some advanced buzz, but nobody expected it to make $100 million and to result in all these nominations. So I think it wins for Best Picture. And the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner will win for Best Director. But in Best Director, don't overlook the possibility of this up-and-comer, this kid named Steven Spielberg, winning for Best Director. We've seen in some years where Best Picture and Best Director are separated. I know sometimes people say, well, how did it win Best Picture if it didn't have the Best Direction? But that's just a way of honoring more than one performance, uh, director, artist, if you will, or the film itself. We'll talk a little bit about that in some of the other, cat other categories as well. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, Spielberg is still, he's a legend, guys, and this was his most personal film, and I think, you know, there's still uh, a, a traditional voter block that's very large and substantial, so Steven Spielberg might win. Uh, one of the really cool things this year is in the Best Actor category, all five nominees are first-timers. So somebody's going to win their first Academy Award. That you can be guaranteed of. Uh, the last time that all of the nominees were first-timers was 1935. And if somebody says, where was I when that Oscar ceremony took place, how dare you? Uh, and this was so long ago that there were uh, just three Best Actor nominees in 1935, Clark Gable, Frank Morgan, William Powell, incredible uh, group. But this is the first time since 35. These guys are all first-time nominees. It's pretty cool. Uh, it comes down to Austin Butler versus Brendan Fraser. I do think Brendan Fraser is going to win. Uh, but this is kind of interesting because most years we know for sure who's going to win by the time we get to the Oscars, and we really don't this year. That's a that's a true toss up. As is Best Actress, where it could be Michelle Yao for everything, everywhere, all at once. She's picked up a lot of the major awards leading up to the Oscars, but Kate Blanchett is still the favorite for Tar. Incredible performance. I think one of the locks uh, when you're filling out your pool this year is K. Wee Kwan for everything, everywhere, all at once. It's a great performance. Uh, and Hollywood loves the feel-good story about somebody, you know, as a kid, he was in all these blockbusters and then kind of disappeared from the scene, and now he's back. And, you know, that's a standing ovation moment right there, I think, when Kay, Kay Wee Kwan wins for everything, everywhere, all at once. And then Supporting Actress is another one where it's a real toss-up between Angela Bassett for Wakanda Forever and Jamie Lee Curtis, who's picking up all this momentum with some recent upset wins. A, a month ago, everybody thought Angela Bassett was going to win for Wakanda Forever. Now, I think the momentum is switching a little bit. And Jamie Lee Curtis is another great feel-good story. You know, comes from Hollywood royalty. Her parents are famous actors. Uh, she's been acting for more than 40 years, guys. If you go all the way back to the original Halloween, and she's kind of the original, the term they use in horror movies is final girl. You know, the girl that... that tries to make it to the end and often does and eludes the killer, the final girl, which in the new Scream movie, they actually do a whole monologue about the history of the final girl. Uh, and by the way, the original Halloween, uh, you know, of course, is set in, in Illinois town, but you can see the palm trees in the background. But that's just the magic of Hollywood. You got to go with it sometimes. But everybody loves Jamie Lee. She's, she's I don't, I've never heard from anybody who doesn't, didn't love working with her, who doesn't enjoy her, and she's such a delight. And a legacy and someone who's this is you know never really gotten a lot of acting honors before, even though she's given great performances in some memorable blockbusters, uh, including Trading Places and True Lies, et cetera, et cetera. So this might be her year. I did put Angela Bassett on my ballot. I'm going to stick with that. So those are, are my thoughts, guys, leading right up uh, to the, the last few days here, the Academy Awards, uh, Sunday night, ABC. It's the 95th annual Academy Awards. One other interesting wrinkle, if we go right back to the beginning of our talk, and uh, Will Smith, who of course has been suspended from the Academy, which means he cannot vote and cannot attend any Academy events. Now, normally he would be presenting the Best Actress Oscar. The previous year's Best Actor winner presents Best Actress, and the previous year's Best Actress winner presents Best Actor. Uh, I talked to Jessica Chastain. She was in Chicago recently to talk about George and Tammy, which is the uh, Showtime uh, limited series. She just got a SAG award for that. She's also on Broadway right now in a doll's house. But she is going to make the flight and make the trip and present the Best Actor Award at the Academy Awards. Now, who's going to present Best Actress? They haven't announced it as of our discussion right now. I thought it might be cool if they brought a bunch of previous Best Actor winners out from different you know, decades, you could have Richard Dreyfuss and Al Pacino and Michael Douglas and, and people like that. So we'll see what happens there. So that's just a small break from tradition. They can't have the usual presenter. So that's it for the Academy Awards run up, guys. It's Sunday on ABC. Should be interesting. Uh, again, you still have a couple of days to fill out your ballot. I do have this caveat for you. Uh, I have gotten well, it used to be 24. I got 24 out of 24 one year, so I bring that up all the time. I also get 16 out of 23 uh, in recent years, 15, 16, 17. Uh, so don't yell at me. You know, you got to make a couple of upset picks, especially when we get into some of the categories like uh, live action short and documentary short. Uh, the contenders are all worthy. There are places you can go online and see them for free. And sometimes it's kind of difficult to figure out which one is going to capture the fancy of the voters. So 
Buyer beware. Uh, we've got tons of questions. Uh, Brian, why don't we start uh, going through some of the questions you guys submitted to us? Absolutely. This one from Karen P. How do you feel about only the best picture having 10 nominees? You know, it's interesting, Karen. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, as everybody knows, and just about every other category, it's five nominees. Uh, there's been a, an evolution and kind of a roller coaster ride for the best picture uh, award uh, through the decades. Uh, for the first ceremony, only three films were nominated. We mentioned that in 1935, there were only three actors nominated. They didn't even have a set number then. Then they expanded it to eight and to 10 and even to 12 at one point for best picture. Dropped it back down, and then in, I think, 1945, it was reduced to, to the five-picture uh, limit, which remained until 2009, and then it was adjusted to 10. Now it could be between five and 10, and now it's been a full 10. I, I, I want to throw this out at you. Um, if you look at some other uh, competitions that happen in March, for example, um, March Madness and the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament, I think about... 19% of teams make it into March Madness. Uh, last year, in 2022, uh, for the Academy Awards, the Academy said there were 301 movies that were eligible. There's certain uh, eligibility requirements. It has to play in one of six major markets. Uh, it has to be released between the first of the year and the 31st of the year. That's That rule has changed, changed during COVID, but that's what it's back to being. So if you look at the fact that there were 301 films eligible and only 10 made it, we're talking like, you know, 3%, right? Uh, so it's, it's actually a very elite category. I think it's great. I think it's great for the business. Listen, we know one of the reasons they did it was so that films like, uh, you know, Black Panther a few years ago and Top Gun Maverick this year, big commercial blockbusters can say that they were nominated for Best Picture. More people have seen those movies, so might tune into the ceremony. It's always cool, no matter what, even if you get shut out at the Oscars to say your film was nominated for Best Picture. So it's still a really elite group. So I'm all for it. Thanks, Karen. This next one is coming from Mike M. The Oscars made a uh, concerted effort to recruit younger and more diverse members mm -hmm. in the past few years. Do you think that has had an impact on the films and performances that get nominated? And if so, what do you think that impact is? Yeah, Mike, uh, the, a lot of the changes were implemented around 2016, 2017. We had even prior to that some years where all 20 acting nominees were white. There was this this growing concern that the Academy was, uh, was becoming increasingly elitist and out of touch. So I think it's great, first of all. They've added literally a couple thousand members, uh, a lot more uh, people of color, a lot more women, a lot more international voters. And I think that's probably reflected in the success of something like Everything Everywhere All at Once. Having said that, um, here are the numbers even now. In 2022, 81% of voting members are white and 67% are men. So it's still, a, a, you know, overall a very kind of old school type of group. But it's evolving. And here's another interesting wrinkle, Mike. Uh, it used to be that if you were in the academy, uh, you were in for life, which meant, and, you know, God bless them, a lot of actors and costume designers and editors, you name it, uh, would get into be their you know their 80s and 90s and out of the business for 20 or 30 years and could still vote and maybe we're not seeing all the movies that were eligible. Uh, the way it works now is if you get inducted into the academy, if you're invited to join the academy, your voting status lasts for 10 years. But during that 10 year period, you have to have been involved actively in at least one motion picture. So if you're 20 or 30 years out of the business, with all grace and due respect you won't have your vote anymore. Uh, but if you continue to work in the business, you'll keep it for life. All right. And this next question comes from Mark Paul L. Uh, what, in your opinion, makes a, quote, best movie or, quote, best performance? When the overall quality is so high, how does one film or one actor stand out? It's whatever I say is the best. <laughs> That's it. That is the one and only decision. I, you know, Mark Paul, this is this is the subjective nature of all of this. Uh, what makes the best movie? Uh, you know, I think if we look at it from the viewpoint of the Academy, which I don't always agree with, they definitely tend to reward more prestige projects. 
uh, films about war, films about uh, people in serious crises. We've talked a lot about how, how historically comedies and action films don't get their due from the Academy. So I think in the terms of what the voting is for the Oscars, the actual subject matter is a huge determining factor. I don't necessarily agree with that. I, you know, and you've heard actors say this uh, forever, that a lot of them find comedy more challenging than drama. Uh, we've seen a lot of actors who can do both uh, uh, through, the, through, the, through the century, if you will. Uh, but the Academy still tends to reward serious dramas. Uh, the last pure comedy to really win big at the Academy Awards was Annie Hall in 1977. Uh, some would argue Shakespeare in Love uh, was also primarily a comedy. Other than that, not only has no comedy won Best Picture, very few have even been nominated. Our next question comes from Siri H. Uh, in your opinion, what elements should a film encompass to be a contender for an Oscar? Uh, this kind of goes uh, hand in hand with Mark Paul's question. You know, what elements should a film encompass? I mean, there are the basics, the same things I look for when reviewing a film, the acting, the storytelling, the directing, the sound, the cinematography, the editing. But there's also the intangibles, Siri. And I think when it comes to rewarding best picture or when it comes to when I pick my favorite movie of the year my favorite movies it's how it hits you and and what if you know there's that certain magic that goes into movie making we talked about all the elements both technical and and creative although the technical elements are also very creative but sometimes there's just the way a movie hits you and you can look at something like for example rocky you know the best picture winner in 1976 which to this day first of all the you know it spawned a billion dollar multi-billion dollar franchise we just had creed the ninth uh entry in the franchise but i've gone back and watched that in the last six months or so and you still get so involved in that it's a classic underdog story it was made for a million dollars everybody knows the underdog story off camera was just as great as the underdog story that was told but there's just something about that kind of classic storytelling and then just the emotional intangible factor that it factor that that weighs into it as well and carleen l asks uh are there any oscar snubbed movies that is that did not make it on the slate for best picture nomination uh, you know it's interesting because every year when the nominations come out uh you see a million articles online and on tv and in the, in the newspapers about who was snubbed, you know, as if we're in an episode of a Mean Girls adaptation, as if you know, people say, I'm going to snub this person or this film. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, with the 10 best picture uh, slates available, there are a lot of favorites on there that didn't make it, but, you know, I, I don't know necessarily that anything was snubbed. I think you see it more in the acting categories. A lot of people were very surprised that Viola Davis and or Danielle Deadweiler didn't get nominated for The Woman King until, respectively. Uh, the lack of a female director, whether it be Sarah Polly or uh, Gina prince Bythewood or Charlotte Wells for Women Talking, Woman King, and After Sun, respectively, th that was pretty surprising. Uh, in, in terms of a movie, one film that I thought got snubbed, if you will, or, or really overlooked was Jordan Peele's Nope. A, a great film, his third great film in a row, and it got nothing, not even for sound and special effects, which were just brilliant in there. And a lot of people thought uh, Kiki Palmer might get nominated for Best Supporting Actress. She gave, if you haven't seen Nope, you got to check it out, but Kiki Palmer gave the type of supporting performance that gets uh, the attention of voting uh, academy members it's it's funny it's brilliant she's the heart and soul of the movie she has a lot of the best lines and she she steals every scene she's in without being selfish about it so i would put that in a snub category if you will carlene and to follow up terry s if you picked the oscars as you did with roger ebert on your old show that we all miss who would win best picture best actor and best actress categories love it love it Terry. Yeah, going back to when I did, did the movie review program with the late, great Roger Ebert, who started this tradition with Gene Siskel on Siskel and Ebert. They would do a special every year if we picked the winner. So they'd go through each category. And it was really fun when we do it because we'd put on tuxedos and open each other's envelopes and everything. So uh, I'll go through uh, the, the categories that Terry mentioned. Uh, for Best Picture, as much as I admired everything, everywhere, all at once, I would have gone with The Whale or Banshees of Inisherin. Now, Banshees of Inisherin, a lot of people 
really enjoyed. It's a very dark, it is kind of a comedy, if you will. We talked about comedy, but very, very dark. And Martin McDonough, who did Three Billboards and In Bruges, another film with Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell, uh, is a great filmmaker. Uh, the Whale is very polarizing. You know, everybody admires Brendan Fraser's performance. Not everybody loved Darren Aronofsky's film. I thought the play upon it, which was based, is, am- is amazing. I thought the way it was brought to life in a cinematic way, the production design, the cinematography, the staging, the blocking, all of that, where essentially almost everything takes place in this uh, one apartment, was just brilliant. You know, it is a fable, and it either, you know, sweeps you up in its kind of symbolism and magic realism, or it doesn't. And I was deeply moved by it. So I, I would go with one of those two pictures. Uh, for Best Actor, I would go with Brendan Fraser for The Well. That's my pick if we pick the winner. And then for Best Actress, my favorite performance is actually Andrea Riseborough for To Leslie. Carol A. asks along those same lines, does Austin Butler's recent BAFTA and Golden Globe wins make him a top contender for Best Actor? Yes, Carol, to answer your question, absolutely. Um, All of these major awards, Golden Globes, BAFTA, SAG Awards, Producers Guild, Directors Guild, the Golden Globes and, and BAFTA were in the spotlight for decades. Some of these other industry awards, SAG awards have been around not that long, about three decades and not always on TV. But because of the nature of our online world and social media and the fact that you guys as moviegoers, are, it's a much savvier and, and more astute group than the casual movie fan, you know, I think of 25, 30 years ago. So it's almost like the primary season in election. We kind of have a pretty good idea in most categories. That's why this year is kind of interesting because there are some toss ups. But we kind of have an idea who's going to win because of these. Uh, run-up events that tell you, well, he won this, he won that. So Austin Butler, who probably, listen, he was terrific, but when he won the Golden Globe, when he won the BAFTA, then there was really a groundswell of people thinking, wow, this maybe he's going to win uh, for Best Actor. And I also like the fact that he's still having trouble losing his Elvis accent uh, in some of these award ceremonies, that he's still talking a little bit like Elvis and has admitted that because you know you don't get we don't get that enough you know you know like like <laughs> when Australian actors do American accents they don't keep doing it uh you know Idris Elba turns out he's British when we see him at, at awards ceremonies even if he's playing an American so that's kind of fun and Stacey B wants to know what are your thoughts about the lack of black nominees in the best actress category how do you think that came about you know, Stacey, I don't know. I, I do, you know, we did mention uh, that uh, Viola Davis, almost everybody thought, she was great in The Woman King. The Woman King was a film, again, not everybody loved, I thought was very strong. And then Danielle uh, Deadweiler for Till, she was amazing. Um, so, you know, what went into the voters' thinking? Sometimes I think voters anticipate what other voters might do or put a performance uh, fifth instead of first on their weighted ballot. I, I don't know what happened. It was a surprise. All right. And uh, Melissa R. says, Angela Bassett is exceptional. Do you think her nomination is part retribution for not winning when she was nominated for What's Love Got to Do With It? Uh, Yeah, 30 years ago, Angela Bassett was nominated for What's Love Got to Do With It. Uh, You know, I think the performance speaks for itself and is well deserving of not only a nomination but a win. But Melissa, you raise a larger point that's absolutely valid, and that is that Voting does not occur in a tunnel or a one-year vacuum, whether it's for the nomination or for the wins themselves. So we've seen historically uh, at the Academy Awards, some of our best actors have won for performances that even they would say was not their best work. So, you know, Al Pacino, all these nominations, and, you know, the fact that he didn't win uh, for playing Michael Corleone, uh, and, and you know, Serpico and tons of other movies, and he won for Scent of a Woman. And it's a fine performance in a kind of a broad, mainstream, audience-pleasing film. But that's not his best performance, but it was time for him to win. Uh, Paul Newman uh, for The Color of Money. And you know, you look at his string of performances in the 60s and 70s where he had been nominated many, many times. I think his best performance of all time is in a movie called The Verdict, uh, if you haven't seen it uh, 
give it a give it a, a twirl. It's really really amazing screenplay by David Mamet. Great performances throughout, but he won. So it becomes a career Oscar in some cases, and I think that also happens with certain nominees. I don't want to get into names here, but once in a while, an actor will be nominated, and the Academy will say, you know, this actor. Has never been nominated before, might not ever be nominated again just because of the arc of their career, so let's vote for them this time around. Uh, the other side of that is you see someone who comes out blazing and gets multiple nominations when they're not even 30 years old, and they might not win because the Academy thinks, well, this particular performer is going to get seven or eight or nine nominations. There's time for them to win the Academy Award somewhere down the road. And Daniel K is asking, uh, K. Wee Kwan appears in most of the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's up for yet. He's up for best supporting actor. Anthony Hopkins only appeared in Silence of the Lambs for 16 minutes Mm -hmm. and yet won best actor. Does this seem arbitrary, unfair, or is it actually to the actor's advantage if the film producers get to decide in which category they would like an actor nominated? Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> to all of that, basically, <laughs> Daniel. Uh, it is arbitrary, though, although there's a misconception that the studios or the producers can decide which category uh, actors will be nominated in. They can campaign and put it out there for your consideration, best supporting actor, and that's you know a very strong suggestion. But it's actually up to the Academy voters. In the early stages, they get a list of all of the actors who are eligible. You can nominate, uh, uh, submit, I should say, Studios can submit up to 10 performances per film. I'm pretty sure that's that's it. Don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure that's the number. And then the voters decide whether they're going to nominate them in supporting actor or actor category. You mentioned Kei Wee Kwan, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's a lead performance. And you also mentioned the most famous example of all, Silence of the Lambs, which is more than two hours long. And Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal Lecter's in there for about 16 and a half minutes. Uh, it's clearly Jodie Foster's uh, story. Scott Glenn has has more airtime, but he but but Anthony Hopkins dominated in such a way that he was put up for best actor and won. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis was put up for best actor in Gangs of New York. When you go back and you watch the movie, it's Leonardo DiCaprio's story from start to finish, and then there's this looming presence of this giant. Uh, Same thing with Wall Street, really, where Michael Douglas won for Best Actor. Uh, Charlie Sheen's Bud Fox is the the anti-hero, if you will, of the story, the protagonist. We follow his arc all the way through it. We don't see Gordon Gekko for a long time leading up to it, but every time he's in a scene, he dominates. So I think sometimes people just go, even though it's not the most screen time, it's the dominant lead performance. Awesome. And Brad S. is now asking, what are your thoughts on the controversy surrounding Andrea Riceboro's nomination? Do you think she is deserving? Uh, that, well, uh, first of all, that controversy is all my fault. Uh, for folks who don't know the story behind this, I, I say that semi-facetiously. So here's what happened, if you, people don't know about this. Andrea Riceboro's in this amazing film called To Leslie. Very small film. It made like $27,000 in its initial release. Now, it has done a lot better since then because of all the uh, great reviews and the word of mouth. So in my end-of-the-year piece listing the top 10 movies of the year for the Chicago Sun-Times, I had to Leslie at number five, and I wrote, as much as I admired Kate Blanchett's work in Tar, my favorite performance by a woman this year was delivered by Andrea Riseborough in To Leslie. And I mentioned that it's one of the great portrayals and interpretations of the ravages of alcoholism right up there with, you know, uh, leaving Las Vegas and Crazy Heart, the film itself, and the performance. Uh, The problem arose then when the official Instagram account for To Leslie quoted my piece. And then it was picked up and retweeted by tons of people. In the meantime... Reese Witherspoon and a lot of other great actors were actually hosting screenings of the movie in Los Angeles to highlight Andrea Riseborough's performance because the film had no budget for for doing any kind of publicity. And then there was a complaint, and the Academy got involved because you're not supposed to, in any ad campaign for the Oscars, you're not supposed to mention any other performances. And because my original quote mentioned Kate Blanchett and they used that, that was considered a violation. Obviously, I didn't do anything wrong. I could, you know compare performances so then there was all this big to do they were never going to take away the nomination because of some ad campaign 
to me, honestly, too, um, it's Brad. To your question, it, the whole thing was kind of ridiculous because the I, listen, I get it. You don't want ad campaigns where you know people are saying that performance sucked and this was great, but for the academy to say like, oh, you shouldn't mention any other performances, you know, it's kind of a competition. Uh, the Academy Awards, in and of themselves, are a competition. What they say is, here here are the five best performances. They're better than all the other ones in the other 301 movies. Literally more than 1,000 performances. And now we're going to pick the best out of those five. So there's five great ones, but four of you are going to be losers. Now, of course, they don't want to put it that way, but that's what happens. One person wins and the other one don't on the night of the Oscars. So to me... The idea that just because they quoted me saying I particularly uh, individually preferred Andrea Riseborough's performance over another performance that I said was great, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. So, you know, that they took the ad down off of social media and everybody moved on. And let's just remember, Andrea Riseborough is a chameleon of an actress. She can do anything. She looks so different and sounds so different. And the performance is absolutely deserving. Uh, Jimmy G asks, uh, how many new films did you watch this past <laughs> year? What was the lousiest film you watched? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jimmy, you rabble rouser. You, you, you stirring up trouble. Uh, to answer your first question, new films, about 10 years ago, I, maybe a little longer than that, I started adding reviews of streaming and, and network television, but mostly streaming because of the advent of so many great series and documentaries and true crime specials, et cetera on Netflix and Prime Video and Apple TV Plus and just the, the rise of all of those services. So uh, I probably, my review schedule now is maybe 60% movies, 40% streaming. I know I had more than 300 reviews last year, but I I saw way more than that because I watch it. The only way I can decide what I, whether I'm going to review something is to watch it. We know I'm going to review the big Avengers movies, the big Marvel movies, the prestige uh, streaming series. And then there's a lot of other stuff that falls into the category of let's see it. I mean, to Leslie's a classic example of that. I watched the film and was blown away by it. If I didn't love it, I probably wouldn't have reviewed it because there's no point in drawing attention to a small film just to say, don't see it. Uh, so that's my answer to how many films I watched last year. As far as the lousiest, it, you know, I actually stopped doing my worst movies of the year list only because you can get the reviews of everything at the Sun-Times website, you can see what I thought of films. I've already spent 800 to 900 to 1,000 words telling you how much I didn't like Amsterdam or Blonde or Morbius, to throw out a few examples. But I, I just felt like it was almost piling on at the end of the year to say, here's the worst, and to do more celebration. Listen, I'm still going to rip a film and be as tough as ever when it comes to the actual critiques, but I, I'm no longer doing like this was the worst of the worst film of the year. Uh, Stephanie S. follows up with, what's your favorite thing about your job? You know, Stephanie, this kind of ties in with uh, Jimmy G's question about how many films in, that I watched last year. Uh, the thing I love about the job and the thing that Roger Ebert loved about the job when I first, first started doing the show with him was that discovery of a new filmmaker or actor uh, – kind of bursting on the scene and we get to share that with every everybody you know how everybody on your text threads everybody wants to be the first to report on something that happened whether it's in your own group or something in the news you want to be first and there's something really magical about seeing something like to leslie and knowing that maybe i can help this film out in my small corner of the world and let people know about it and i'll go back some 20 years uh plus um when uh a film called Monster came out. Charlize Theron won the Academy Award for playing the serial killer. She completely transformed herself. Now, this is, again, guys, like 20 years ago, there wasn't all the advanced hype and all the online stuff that you have nowadays. And sometimes Roger and I would see a movie and know just a little bit about it before we saw it. We'd see it months in advance. And at the end of that movie, Roger, he couldn't believe it. He didn't know it was Charlize Theron. I had been told in advance it was her. He didn't know it was her until the credits. And he was, he, you know, we walked out. He's like, holy bleep. I can't believe it. You know, that, that you know, gorgeous, beautiful, you know, budding movie star completely disappeared into this role. And, you know, we raved about it on the show. He raved about it in his reviews. And uh, that is the part I love most about the job is being to share those moments. 
All right, we have one final question, but before we get to that, we want to remind everyone that they can still cast their ballot for Beat the Critic with Richard Roper. Uh, we'll put at the link on your screen right now. You have until 1159 on Saturday, March 11th to get your ballots in. So make sure you go to the link right here on your screen and do that. And to wrap up today, we have a question from Tawana D. For Richard, what projects are you working on in the coming months? Oh, Thanks for that question. Uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter, it's at Richard E. Roper. You might know that I love to do this regular feature called Movie Law, uh, where I talk about certain things that happen in the movies and on TV that everybody recognizes, tropes through the decades. Uh, for example, Movie Law, uh, if you get shot in the shoulder, you get to sit on the uh, edge of the ambulance at the end of the movie with a blanket around your shoulders and a cup of coffee and then that person who doubted your theories, the whole movie, will come over and tell you you were right. Apparently, there's no rush to get you to the hospital, even though you were shot in the shoulder. Uh, and another movie law I mentioned recently was if you sustain a terrible facial injury, if you get punched in the nose or a big scrape, uh, the injury will look horrible for one scene. And then in the second scene... After that, it will have faded. And then by the third scene after that horrible, terrible injury, by the third scene after that, it completely disappears because they want their actors to be seen by everybody. So those are movie laws, and I'm, I'm talking to folks about maybe expanding that into a coffee table book and maybe even some sort of uh, television series or something like that, going through all the great movie laws that we love and embrace. We love those cliches. They're great. Yeah. That's what keeps the keeps the keeps the film moving. Um, thank you, everyone who submitted your questions uh, for Richard. Again, don't forget to submit your ballot for Beat the Critic at the URL on your screen right now. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, good luck on your predictions. And we will see you at the Oscars. 